We got to see the exciting debut of an Orioles top prospect this weekend as D.L. Hall was called up to make his Major League debut on Saturday. But it didn't go quite as planned, and the Orioles lost a pivotal series to the Rays this weekend. I'll break it all down coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, August 15th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles three-game series at the Trop against the Tampa Bay Rays this weekend with the Orioles losing two out of three in their final series against the Rays. I'll get you my three big takeaways from the weekend having to do with the debut of DL Hall, the roller coaster weekend for the offense, and a really good start from Austin Voth on Friday night. Plus, we'll take a look at what this series really means moving forward for the Orioles. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. Before we get there, just want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms, whether it be Apple Pods or Spotify. If you could leave a five-star rating and a review on those apps, it really helps out. And then, of course, right here on the Locked On Orioles YouTube page, make sure to hit that red subscribe button and like and comment on the videos. Thank you to all of you who have hit that red subscribe button here on Locked On Orioles. And we've gotten over 1,000 subscribers, which I promised last week. If we got over 1,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel, I would do a giveaway. Well, you're here on a Monday episode. Here's what you're going to get, potentially. The Cedric Mullins... 30-30 bobblehead could be yours in the box still in it right here could be yours if you can do two things one if you're not already you must be subscribed to the locked on orioles youtube channel two leave a comment either on the youtube channel on this episode or on any episode for the rest of this week monday through friday with your favorite moment at Oriole Park at Camden Yards history that you have attended. If you haven't been to Oriole Park yet, that's okay. Comment with your favorite moment that you've seen happen at Oriole Park. Again, in the comments of any video on YouTube, Monday through Friday, just subscribe to the YouTube channel and leave a comment of what your favorite moment that either you've seen in person or you've seen on TV at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, of course, with the 30th anniversary of the ballpark, and you will be entered to win the Cedric Mullins 30-30 Club bobblehead. I will make the drawing completely random on Friday, and then we will announce the winner on next Monday's episode of Who Gets This Cedric Mullins Bobblehead. But again, we'll get back to that further throughout the week. But here on the podcast, again, thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. And for your first listen today, Orioles and Rays, an absolutely pivotal three game series this weekend at the Trop. And it started off well for the Orioles. The bats came out hot as they won Friday's opener 10 to 3. It was one of the best offensive performances of the year for the Orioles. We'll get to that a little bit later, but they win the first game of the series. And it was pivotal to win this series. But then the bats went quiet, things went downhill. And they lost the next two games. After winning 10 to 3 on Friday, they lost 8 to 2 on Saturday, lost the finale, the rubber match, 4 to 1 on Sunday, and lost two out of three in the series. The Orioles fall to 59 and 55 on the season. They now are still, right now, seventh in the American League. They sit a game and a half back of the Tampa Bay Rays for the third and final wild card spot. And to be fair, it was not a great weekend for Toronto or Seattle, who both lost series as well. So those teams kind of came back down to Tampa's level. So the Orioles are just a game and a half back of Tampa. They are just two games back of Seattle. They hold the second wild card spot. And they're just two and a half games back of Toronto, who, of course, the Orioles start a series with north of the border starting tonight. So the O's could potentially, if all things go right in this series, pass Toronto in the standings this week. But 
The O's did allow some teams behind them to make up some ground. The Minnesota Twins are just a half game behind the Orioles. And now the Chicago White Sox, who had a really productive weekend against the Tigers, swept them, are now also just a half game behind the Orioles as well. The Boston Red Sox, three games back of the O's going into play on Monday. So that's where we stand. The Orioles lose the series. Let's get to my first big takeaway. And of course it is DL Hall made his major league debut on Saturday to some mixed results as he got the start in the Orioles eight to two loss at the Trop. Now, obviously the good was getting the news that DL Hall was going to be called up. We didn't really know when it was going to happen. We were hoping soon, you know, I talked about on this podcast, Hey, maybe they use him in a relief role early, but Rock Cabaco of Masson Sports, the first to report on Friday that D.L. Hall was being called up to the major leagues. Now, all he reported was that he was joining the team. We weren't quite sure what his role would be, but later in the day, Andy Koska, a friend of this podcast of the Baltimore Sun, did report that Hall would be starting the Saturday game. So Hall was not activated for the Friday game. Obviously, you want to keep a full bullpen. And then on Saturday afternoon, the Orioles activated D.L. Hall, and in a little bit of a surprising move, they optioned Nick Vespi back down to AAA to make room. Now, Vespi still has another option left this season. Remember, you get the five maximum options. He, that is now his fourth. And Nick Vespi, who did give up the you know game-winning hit in Thursday night's loss to the Red Sox, but in general has been solid as a you know a middle relief guy as a lefty this year, goes down to AAA again. He'll now have to wait 15 days to come back up. So unless there's an injury, he can't come back up until August 28th. But we did think, hey, at least this is hopefully for D.L. Hall to take over as a starter. Well, then we learned from Rock Kabaka reporting that although Hall would be starting Saturday's game, that would be his only start most likely. And then the, the Orioles would then move him into the bullpen after that. And to be honest, I kind of liked that role. I liked that you, you get him to the big leagues and he knows when he's going to pitch for his debut because it's tough for high leverage or you know high profile pitchers to come up who have been starting their whole careers and then come up immediately into the bullpen. I thought it was going to be the perfect transition. You call him up, you have him start on the first day so he knows exactly when he's pitching. He can get all the nerves out. He can pitch. And then you put him in the bullpen. Obviously, he doesn't pitch for another four days. And then you start bringing him out of the pen in one and two inning stints. So it seemed like that was going to be the plan. And so going to that start, obviously there was a lot of excitement. And the other thing is, it wasn't just any pitcher on the other side for Tampa. It was Shane McClanahan, another hard-throwing lefty who right now is probably the front runner for the American League Cy Young Award. So what a pitching matchup we had. And it didn't start out great for D.L. Hall. He had a couple of runners on in the first, gave up a run on an RBI grounder, but got out of the inning. It was one nothing. Orioles got him two runs in the top of the second. O's took a 2-1 to lead. And then D.L. Hall showed off the good stuff, striking out the side of Tampa Bay hitters in the bottom of the second. That was when we thought, okay, things are about to get real. It's liftoff from here, as uh, Mike Elias would say. But that was not quite the case, as Hall then allowed three runs in the third, another in the fourth, and did not finish the fourth. And his final line in his major league debut, three and two-thirds innings of work, five runs allowed on five hits. He struck out six. He walked three, did not allow a homer, and threw 76 pitches, although just three hard-hit balls against Hall in his three and two thirds innings of work. So it was certainly an up and down for DL Hall, who, you know, comes up after making 18 starts in AAA, had a 476 ERA, 114 strikeouts to 44 walks in 70 innings. And he had struggled a little bit recently in AAA, but his last AAA start on August 7th, you know, he went five and a third, allowed only two runs and struck out eight. So it was a good time coming off a, a good start to call him up. And again, the results were mixed. He got seven whiffs on the day. You know, he ended up throwing, as I said, 76 pitches, seven whiffs on 33 swings. And as we've seen from young guys, who especially guys who have power fastballs like D.L. Hall, he was just very fastball heavy in his first start. And honestly, that wasn't really surprising. You know, he was 58% fastballs on the day, 44 of his 76 pitches, just 18% changeup, 16% slider, and 8% curveball. I wasn't super surprised he went to the fastball a lot. He got three whiffs on that pitch. Velocity was a tick below we've seen at times in the minors. He averaged 95.4 miles an hour, maxed out at 97.2 with that four-seam fastball in terms of velocity. And most of the hits did come off of that fastball as well. At the end of the day, though, I thought the command of the fastball was good enough. 
I did think, though, the slider, which could be his number two pitch. Now, he threw it the third most times. He threw you know, 14 changeups and 12 sliders. You could tell he did not have the command of his slider. He got two whiffs on the pitch, but did not get a called strike on that pitch all day where he was able to drop the changeup in the zone. It, it definitely looked like his number two pitch, that changeup did. But the slider command, he just didn't quite have it, wasn't able to drop it in for a strike, wasn't able to get as many swings and misses, You know, getting guys to chase that slider because he wasn't throwing it for a lot of strikes. So he had to go to the changeup more often. And although the, I thought the changeup did look good as opposed to the slider, when he doesn't have that slider, you know, he loses a little bit. And of course, you know, he was getting hit a little bit early. You know, the spin rates weren't crazy high. That's not as important for a guy like him. But in general, I thought there were definitely positives to, to have a, you know, an inning where you strike out the side in the second to have six strikeouts and three and two thirds is a good number. You'd like to walk less than three batters. And of course, you know, a four pitch walk to start the game was Certainly a little troubling, a guy who, you know, it's been talked about a lot, his command issues, his walk issues, and what does he do to start this game, but walk Yu Chang on four pitches who, you know, came around to score the first run in that first inning. So that was not how you wanted D.L. Hall to start his major league career. But the six strikeouts, I will certainly take. The fastball velocity, I will take. The changeup, I will take. You hope the slider gets back. And at the end of the day, Happy he got to make his major league debut. You know, the Orioles' number two ranked pitching prospect behind Grayson Rodriguez. Just happy to see him get to the big leagues. But that's when things got a little weird after that. Because Hall gets to the bigs. We had heard that the potential plan was he starts one game, he goes to the bullpen. And then the Orioles option Hall back to AAA after the game. And they recall Logan Gillespie to enter back into the bullpen. And the reasoning given by Brandon Hyde and Mike Elias after the game is that the Orioles' plan is to send him back to AAA where he will work out of the bullpen in the minors, something he really hasn't done. He will get used to that reliever role for the next 15 days because remember, once he's been optioned, he can't come back up for 15 days. And then when he can return to the big leagues, which would be on August 28th, he would come back to the bigs as a reliever and would help the Orioles out of the bullpen throughout September in what hopefully is going to be a playoff run for the O's. Now, again, I was behind this plan of putting him in the bullpen for the stretch run. I don't quite get this part of it. Now, D.L. Hall seems to be bought in, at least from what he said after the game. But you generally see a lot of guys who are relievers in the majors first. Then you want to turn them into starters. So you send them down to AAA to build them up as starting pitchers. Rarely do you see guys who are starters in the minors get called up to be a starter, and then you send them back down to AAA to build, essentially build down as a reliever. You'll usually see guys do what we thought the plan was going to initially be, just kind of come up, maybe start once or twice, then get moved to the pen for the rest of the year, and just be right there. I'm not sure how much acclimating he can really do in the bullpen, I mean, obviously, it's going to be a new thing for him. He's been a starter his whole life. And the Orioles' plan for him moving forward is still to be a starter long-term. He's going to compete in spring training next year as a starting pitcher. But it's smart. The Orioles are in a playoff race. He's got nasty stuff from the left side. You use him in one or two inning spurts, he's going to be throwing 100 with a knockout slider, and it's going to be awesome out of the bullpen. It's a good move. But unless you're really worried about Hall's preparation as a reliever, that's the only thing I could think of here, that maybe they're worried that because he's always been a starter, he's never had to do a reliever-type warm-up and you know a reliever-type prep to pitch every other day or every third day instead of every five days. And so they maybe want him for two weeks in AAA to get used to doing that. They'll have him on probably a regimented schedule where he won't really pitch in terms of game situation. He'll just kind of, they'll know each day that he's going to pitch to maybe get him more ready to be a reliever in the bigs, and then you call him up in 15 days. I guess that makes sense. But when you're going from a starter to a reliever, that's much easier to do in the big leagues. And you would think he could just kind of do it in the big leagues. I thought he would sit for the next four days. He'd be in the big league bullpen. And then, you know, by Thursday of this week, he'd be ready to pitch out of the pen for the Orioles. I thought that'd be kind of the easy decision to make. That's not what the Orioles did. And... Hopefully, when those 15 days are up, he'll be immediately back in the big leagues in the bullpen for the Orioles, and it'll make it a little easier because right after those 15 days comes September 1st when the rosters expand 
by two spots to 28 guys. It'll make it easier to get Hall back in the big leagues, but I'm not sure I get it. The start wasn't the best. I, I am on board with him being a reliever down the stretch for this team. Not totally behind him going back to AAA, but that's what the Orioles are going to do, and hopefully it all works out. He comes back in two weeks and can dominate out of this Oriole bullpen. Obviously, D.L. Hall, though, was the big story for the Orioles this weekend. But another story when you flip to the bats was just how different these bats looked from Friday, dominating, to Saturday, a little bit of struggles, and then Sunday, well, Drew Rasmussen was perfect against them for on Sunday for eight innings. So coming up next, we're going to talk about the kind of roller coaster weekend for the Orioles bats. But first, got to tell you about LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Because as you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. You can create a job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. And they've got simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and who you'd like to hire. And LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So we're talking the Orioles weekend with D.L. Hall making his major league debut in Saturday's loss. But when you flip to the offensive side, it was a very odd up and down roller coaster weekend for the Orioles. Because you start with what happened on Friday, the one win of the weekend for the O's of the Trop. You could make a strong argument that Friday was the Orioles' best offensive game of the year. 10 runs on 19 hits for the Orioles on Friday, where they just never let up on the gas pedal and just kept hitting against this Tampa Bay pitching staff. They get one in the first, one in the second, one in the fifth, four in the sixth, and one each in the seventh, eighth, and ninth. There were only two innings in this game where they didn't score. They kept adding on, and they scored in each of the final five innings of the game. I mean, you had a bunch of guys going off in this game. Cedric Mullins, a three for six, had himself a home run in the game. Adley Rutschman had himself a home run in the game. Just an absolute monster blast from Adley Rutschman in this game in the first inning that opened up the scoring. I mean, that was the best he's hit a ball all year. 107 off the bat. Traveled 439 feet way off the catwalk on Friday night at the Trop. It was a monstrous home run from Adley Rutschman. I mean, you had everybody adding in for this offense. Anthony Santander, three for five with a double and two singles. Austin Hayes had a couple of hits, a single and a double, and a walk as well. You know, Adley Rutschman also drew a walk in this game. Rubned Odor had four hits. Four for five with four singles and two RBIs. And here's the kicker. Jorge Mateo, five for five on Friday night. Five for five with two doubles, three singles, two RBIs, and two runs scored for Jorge Mateo out of the nine hole for the Orioles on Friday. I mean, they had everything working from an offensive standpoint. They went seven for 11 hitting with runners in scoring position in Friday's game. They did everything, and you're thinking, wow, I know that they're going to face McClanahan tomorrow, but if they're going to hit anything close to this all weekend, this is going to be a great series for the Orioles. I mean, they just dominated Corey Kluber on Friday. They got seven runs on 10 hits off of Corey Kluber. He's got two Cy Youngs in his back pocket. And then we go to Saturday, and it just kind of all changes for the Orioles, they get just two runs. Now, they did have nine hits on Saturday, and you know they, they, they got to McClanahan early. They got two runs in the second inning off of Shane McClanahan, and they loaded up the bases, but they left the bases loaded in the top of the second with just a two-to-one lead and then did not score for the final seven innings of that game. And Shane McClanahan's great. He goes six innings, allows just those two runs, but they had him on the ropes early and just couldn't get that big hit. But even Saturday, you know, they got a two for three from Rugnet Odor after a four hit game on Friday night. Robinson Torino's got the start behind the plate. He had a two for four with an RBI 
in this game. I mean, you had hits sprinkled throughout the lineup for the Orioles, and it just didn't happen for them offensively. So you're thinking, all right, you know, they, they had some chances. They had nine hits. They just didn't convert early against one of the best pitchers in baseball. So you're not feeling as good, but you're feeling okay going into Sunday. And then Sunday happens. Drew Rasmussen was very close to throwing a perfect game against the Orioles on Sunday. As you all know, Rasmussen, the race starter, eight perfect innings against the Orioles. Jorge Mateo had to break it up on the first pitch of the ninth. Mateo lines one down the third baseline for a leadoff double to, of course, break up the perfect game and the no hitter. He would eventually score in a wild pitch to break up the shutout as well. Rasmussen actually didn't even finish the game, lasted just eight and a third. Jason Adam had to come in to finish off that raise four to one win on Sunday. But it's not like the Orioles were completely dominated. I mean, he only had seven strikeouts. The Orioles, you know, they did have eight hard hit balls against him. So they squared him up a bit in this game. But Drew Rasmussen is like the perfect example of a five and dive guy. Somebody who has high strikeout rates, throws a lot of pitches, and basically throws five innings and then gets out. He threw eight and a third innings, only needed 87 pitches to do that. When he was through five perfect innings, he had thrown 44 pitches in this game. He was under 80 pitches going into the ninth inning with a perfect game. That's concerning for the Oriole offense. And he had some guys do okay. I mean, Ramon Arias went 0 for 3 with three hard hit balls. He deserved better in that game. And again, Mateo ends up with the only hit that double. And they score the run on after a ground out and a wild pitch. But it's concerning to have that happen. And Drew Rasmussen has had a great year. He's now got a 2.80 ERA in the Rays rotation. But the fact that he's a five and dive guy is concerning that he almost threw a perfect game. And I get Ryan Mountcastle was not in the lineup, was hit by a pitch on the hand in the ninth inning on Saturday, was not in the lineup Sunday. Brandon Hyde said that he's hoping it's not an IL situation, just a day-to-day injury. And, you know, I get that Taron Vavra also was not in the lineup for some reason. Brett Phillips was starting instead on Sunday. But it wasn't like this was a completely punt lineup by the Orioles. It was most of their regulars. You know, you had Nevin and Phillips in there. But other than that, you had your guys. And it just was tough to watch for the Orioles. And obviously, I can say, you know, well, you got some answers. And Kyle Stowers and Gunnar Henderson pretty much ready to go in AAA. I've hit that point again and again here on this podcast. But definitely just a weird offensive weekend. The ups and downs. Hopefully it's more of the ups of Friday than the downs of Sunday, but we will see because these games are not getting any easier moving forward for the Orioles. But even though the O's did lose this series and the offense sputtered on Sunday and D.L. Hall didn't pitch his best as back in the minors, I wanted to focus on really the biggest positive from the weekend in my final takeaway, and that was Austin Voth's start on Friday night. He is turning into maybe something a little bit special for the Orioles after claiming him off waivers from the Nats. And coming up next, we'll talk about his start Friday night and what he's changed in Baltimore to make him pitch this well. But first, got to tell you about betonline.net, your number one place to find all your sports events, favorite sports, odds, lines, games. It's the number one online place for all your sports betting needs. You can find news on every league, including Major League Baseball, but also the NFL season creeping up. You got the NBA, the NHL, and every weekend combat sports, esports, and golf every weekend as well. And Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering info from live in game betting, scores, and podcasts. They have you covered. So head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today at Bet Online, where the game starts. So we're talking Orioles and Rays. The O's dropped two out of three to the Rays over the weekend. And, you know, it was a very important series, not just because the Orioles were, you know, jockeying for playoff position. And after the O's won the Friday game, they had jumped into a playoff spot. They were a half game ahead of the Rays. Then they lost the next two, now a game and a half back. But the O's are right in it. But the reason why this series was so important is that it was the final series between the Rays and the Orioles this season. Now, the season series was tied 8-8 to coming in. So the winner of this series was going to win the season series. And the reason why that's so important this year is because starting this year, Major League Baseball has done away 
with the tiebreaker games, the game 163s. You know, when teams are tied in the standings at the end of the year, they play that extra game to decide who wins the division or who wins the wild card, who goes to the playoffs. They're not doing that anymore. What they're doing instead is tiebreakers, head-to-head tiebreakers. So the Orioles lose the season series now 10-9 to to the Rays, and there's a chance they could be tied with the Rays at the end of the season for the final wildcard spot. And if that happens, the Rays will go to the playoffs and the Orioles will go home. And the reason why it's a little concerning is that the Orioles have now officially lost the season series to the Rays. They've lost the season series to the Twins and they've lost the season series to the Mariners. Those are three teams right around them in the wildcard hunt. That is a little concerning, but the Orioles, that's why Sunday's game was the biggest game in six years. And They almost got no hit, but we'll look at the one win of the weekend before we get out of here. That was the 10 to three victory Friday. Obviously the offense was outstanding to get 19 hits, but Austin Voth was something special on Friday night. He wasn't the only pitcher who flirted with a no hit bid this weekend. Austin Voth threw five no hit innings on Friday night. Now he came out in the sixth, allowed an infield single, then a two run homer to a Rosa Arena, And eventually Voth did leave the game. And, you know, didn't extend his no hit bid any further. But his final line Friday night, five and a third innings, two runs on three hits, five Ks, a walk, a home run, 80 pitches, just five hard hit balls against him. And it's been a tale of two teams for Austin Voth. You know, when he came over to the Orioles from the Nationals, when the O's claimed him off waivers, Nats had DFA'd him back at the end of May. He had made 19 relief appearances for the Nats, 18 and two thirds innings. He had a 10.13 ERA. He had allowed 34 hits in 18 and two thirds innings. Well, now in his time with the Orioles, he's made 13 appearances and nine starts with the O's. And in 42 innings, he has a 3.21 ERA with Baltimore, just 39 hits in 42 innings, 41 Ks to just 12 walks in that time. And the Orioles have kind of turned him into a little bit of a different pitcher. Now, both did have success, especially back in 2019 with the Nationals, but this is a new pitcher. And you know, one of the reasons why we kind of saw big time on Friday night is that curveball is a brand new pitch for Austin Both. He had 11 whiffs on Friday. Seven of the 11 came on that curveball, which he threw almost as much as his fastball. Of his 80 pitches Friday night, it was 36 four-seam fastballs, 31 curveballs, and then 10 cutters and three change-ups for both. And the curveball was ridiculous. And you can see when you watch video from his time with the Nats to his time with the Orioles, the O's have had him for two months now. They have already reshaped his curveball and it's become a better pitch. It was kind of more of a 12 6 straight up and down curveball with the Nats. That curveball has more bend, it goes more right to left from the righty Austin Voth now. And he also talked about how he's been working on a sweeper, the new side-to-side slider with pitching coach Chris Holt. Maybe he debuts that at some point. He threw a slider years ago with the Nationals. And the other thing that Voth has done is, you know, he's throwing the same amount of fastballs. He's got a, you know, a solid velocity fastball, 93-95. He's throwing it up in the zone like he's always done. He's throwing it his normal amount. But what he's done is he's cut down on his cutter usage. His cutter has gone from 28% to about 23%, and it continues to drop, only throw it 13% on Friday night. He's bumped way up the curveball usage, which is now his solidified number two pitch, and maybe could be his number one pitch, and he's brought his changeup back. Now, he only threw three changeups in that start on Friday night, but he didn't throw any changeups at all in his 19 appearances with the Nationals this year. So he's brought that pitch back just a little bit, just to toss it in there from time to time. But what's so important with this new breaking ball is that he has identified with help from the Orioles, and he has been quoted in a couple of stories talking about how he can't believe how much data the Orioles have, how much it's helped him to come in, and they've helped him kind of redefine himself as a pitcher. He's reshaped the curveball. He's stuck with what worked with the fastball. He's basically a fastball curveball guy. And at some point here, Austin Voth, I think, is going to move to the bullpen with the Orioles. Just there's going to be more starters coming back, especially next year. I think they're going to hold on to him, but I think he may go to the bullpen. He could be dominant. It's just a fastball curveball two inning guy out of the pen. I think he could be completely nasty. You know, the curveball break continues to move. He adds the sweeper fastball velo goes up in those shorter stints. He could be dominant, but right now as a starter, I mean, what he gave the Orioles was pretty dominant with five, no hit innings. And the Rays just knew that curveball was coming 
and they couldn't do anything about it. Swinging through it again and again on Friday night. And he got five called strikes with it. He could drop it in the strike zone as well. And he still likes his cutter. You know, he can throw it for a strike at any time, but he's throwing it less. He's throwing the curveball way more. Opponents were hitting over 500 against Vogt's curveball when he was pitching for the Nats. He has now flipped that pitch to become by far his best pitch. And now Fangraphs has a pitch value that they assign to every pitch in Major League Baseball. And zero means it's basically an average pitch. His curveball when he was with the Nats this year, its value was a negative 3.8. His curveball with the Orioles so far has been a positive 2.1. Guys don't flip pitches that staunchly that much in the middle of a season, but that's what the Orioles have done for Austin both. And yes, this probably says a lot about how bad the Nats are at developing pitching, which they are, but it also says a lot about how good the Orioles have gotten with Chris Holt and Justin Ramsey and others in this system at developing pitching. And it makes you more excited for the more younger pitchers that are coming through the system. And it makes you excited for what they can do with more waiver claims like Jorge Lopez, like Austin Voth, what they can do for guys even like Spencer Watkins, who was a minor league signing. You, know, you look up and down this pitching staff, the whole bullpen is waiver claims, and they're all pitching lights out. So the O's can continue to do this, and Austin Voth may be the number one example of what the O's can do because he had success with the Nationals, and many people who cover the Nats kind of knew that he had something extra to be unlocked, but the Nats just couldn't unlock it. It seems the Orioles have, and that really bodes well for Voth, and for the Orioles moving forward. But at the end of the day, despite Austin Voth and what he did Friday night, the Orioles still did lose this series. And again, a game and a half back of the Rays for the final wildcard spot now. They're also two and a half back of the Toronto Blue Jays, who are in the number one wildcard spot right now. And the O's, well, they could catch up to the Blue Jays. All they got to do is sweep them because they start a series in Toronto tonight. Orioles and Blue Jays, Kyle Bradish on the mound for the Orioles against Yusei Kikuchi, who the Orioles really touched up last week in Baltimore when he faced the O's. And then here on the podcast, I'll be back with you tomorrow. Of course, we'll recap game one between the Orioles and the Blue Jays, get you the five things you need to know from that one. And then, of course, continue with all your Orioles coverage as this playoff run continues. We'll talk more about D.L. Hall and kind of his situation in AAA and what other roster moves the Orioles could be making here very soon. But that's all coming up on tomorrow's episode. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team? Every day.